Metaverse as a digital identity in Metaverse and recent developments in artificial intelligence are also changing the way we interact with avatars. AI is being used to create more realistic and responsive avatars that can adapt to our actions and provide more engaging and immersive experience in Metaverse. For example, AI can be used to create avatars that can read our facial expressions, body language, and even our emotions and respond accordingly, like now. This can make our interactions with avatars more natural and fluid and can enhance our overall experience in Metaverse. However, the use of AI in avatars also raises ethical concerns. How do we ensure that the use of AI in avatars is not, um, is not used to manipulate or deceive others? Are there ethical concerns with using AI to create avatars that are indistinguishable from real people? Additionally, we must consider how AI keeps existing biases and stereotypes in the development of avatars. Moreover, the use of AI in avatars also raises questions about the future of work and the labor market. As AI be becomes more advanced, it may be possible to create avatars that can perform tasks that were previously performed by human beings, leading to potential job displacement and e economic disruption. Welcome to the extraordinary world of Leon Craigton. Each week we showcase the work of some inspirational artist or designer before we start the tutorials proper. And today we're delighted to have Leon with us. And Leon uh, will be here for a very brief interview. Leon, I should say, is an arch trained as an architect. He's worked for Zahadid Architects for many years and is now running a design practice uh, straddling both London and Shanghai. Leon, great to see you. Tell us something about, about what you do in your practice. Our practice is called LKDN Metaverse, and we specialize in creating immersive virtual experiences in the Metaverse. Our company works with clients to create customized virtual environments that allow users to interact with others in a highly engaging and personalized way on Metaverse and in VR. One of the key areas of expertise for LKDN Metaverse is avatar design. We create highly realistic and customizable avatars that represent users creatively in a virtual environment, allowing for a high degree of personalization and self-expression. We also do R&D in advanced avatar technology, including facial motions, voice recognition, and motion capture, which allows for creating our podcasts about Metaverse via VTubing. In addition to avatar design, we also provide a range of other services related to virtual experience design, including metaverse architecture, world and space building, vehicles design, and event launching, as well as creating generative artworks. Our company works closely with clients and metaverse platforms to understand their needs and goals, and then develops customized solutions that meet those needs. Sometimes our clients are metaverse platforms for which we create custom 3D metaverse assets and do consulting for them to improve their quality of metaverse user experience. We are a key player in metaverse industry in China and outside of China currently, providing cutting edge design solutions that enable clients to create highly engaging and immersive virtual experiences. Our expertise in avatar design world building, 3D assets design, and social interaction design makes it a valuable partner for any organization looking to establish a presence in the metaverse. Thanks. Um, well, maybe you could just say something about avatars. Why, why are you so obsessed in, in, with avatars themselves? Why we do avatars? Avatars are an attractive field to design studios that create metaverse experiences for several reasons. First, avatars are a key element of immersive virtual experiences, allowing users to represent themselves in a virtual world and interact with others in a more personal and engaging way. As such, avatars are an important aspect of creating a sense of presence and social interaction with, within a virtual environment, which is essential for creating a successful metaverse experience. Second, the development of advanced avatar technology has made it possible to create highly realistic and customizable avatars that can accurately represent users in a virtual environment. 
This has opened up new possibilities for personalization and self-expression virtual spaces, allowing users to create avatars that reflect their unique personalities and identities. Uh, the popularity of virtual social platforms such as Second Life, VRChat and Roblox have created growing demand for immersive virtual experiences that allow users to interact with others in a virtual environment. As such, design studios that can create compelling metaverse experience with highly realistic and customizable av avatars are well positioned to capitalize on this trend and attract a large and engaged user base. The growth of the metaverse industry as a whole has created a significant market opportunity for design studios that specialize in creating virtual experiences. With major tech companies such as Facebook, Google and Microsoft investing heavily in metaverse technology, the demand for immersive virtual experience is likely to continue to grow in the coming years creating a significant opportunities for design studios that can create compelling and engaging metaverse experience with advanced avatar technology. So what do you see as the future of avatars? What do you think their future role will do? And what, how, well, how do you imagine, what do you think they're eventually going to be capable of doing? Avatars are digital representation of people that can be used to communicate with others, perform tasks and interact with environment in ways that are not possible with our physical bodies. As technology continues to advance, avatars will become more realistic and more capable, leading to a wide range of new applications. One potential use for avatars in remote work and telecommuting. As more people walk from home or from remote locations, Avatars could allow for more effective communication and collaboration. With a realistic and responsive avatar, workers could participate in virtual meetings and presentations, interact with co-workers and clients, and even attend conferences and events from the comfort of their own homes. Another area where avatars could have a significant impact is the healthcare. With advanced sensors and machine learning algorithms, avatars could be used to monitor patients remotely, track vital signs, and provide real-time feedback to healthcare professionals. This could help to improve patient outcomes and reduce the need for hospitalization and in-person appointments. In the entertainment history, avatars could be used to create immersive experience for users, for example, video game developers could create games that allow players to control realistic avatars in virtual worlds, providing a more engaging and immersive experience. Similarly, virtual reality technology could be used to create interactive movies and TV shows that allow viewers to control avatars and explore virtual worlds. As technology continues to advance, avatars may eventually become capable of performing tasks that are currently impossible with our physical bodies. For example, advanced robotics and artificial intelligence could enable avatars to perform complex physical tasks, such as repairing equipment or conducting scientific experiments in hazardous environments. This could have significant implications for industries such as space exploration, where avatars could be used to explore distant planets and moons. Thanks, Leon. That, that was extraordinary. Um, I'm not telling you anyone which was a Leon and which one was his avatar, but it kind of reminded me of the uh, of the uh, replicants in Blade Runner. Anyway, welcome to the uh, sixth in this series, uh, an introduction to AI for designers. This is our fifth um, tutorial today. Um, we have two more sessions left, uh, Pecha Kucha, which will be next week, and then a roundtable session for the final week, which will be, I think, spectacular. Um, so today we uh, we are focusing on the question of 2D to 3D techniques and plugins. Um, we have George Gida and Daniel Bolo, uh, uh, es Escobar first of all, followed by Maya Mystery and Daniel uh, and Barbara um, Villanova. So um, uh, uh, George Gida is uh, an Italian American. He's a graduate of, uh, of the Architectural Association at Harvard GSD, where he is currently teaching. Um, Daniel Escobar is um, a, uh, a Peruvian American um, who uh, uh, studied architecture initially, then did a master's at Georgia Tech in computer, com computer sciences. And he's the uh, 
he's the co-founder of Ola and a contributor to our um, uh, Digital Futures uh, Spanish channel. Um, Maya Mistry is uh, from India. Um, he is a, an aspiring, so we say, super user as a former student of Randy Deutsch, and he's uh, responsible for um, for uh, about he's about to launch uh, a new two uh, D to three D app along with um, uh, with 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 Barbara. Um, sorry, one second. With um, uh, with uh, uh, Barbara Villanova, um, who is from Brazil, she's had 15 years of working in um, working on BIM, um, and now has has become a developer for um, this particular app. So this should be um, an extraordinary session. Um, I just brief before I hand it over to to George Guidas to say, well, this is these are all the 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 Instagram links which are so useful. Everyone posts their work on Instagram. Um, so take a screen capture of that if you don't uh, um, otherwise have one. I've also put mine in there and also Digital Futures one. And almost most importantly of all of them at the bottom here is the, uh, uh, the, the Digital Futures YouTube channel where all of our sessions are uploaded afterwards and they're available uh, to be viewed by anyone uh, across the globe for free. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing now and I'm going to hand over to, uh, to George. Um, uh, uh, welcome, George. Um, um, good to see you here. Thanks so much, Neil. Thanks, thanks for the invite and thanks, Angelica, for organizing as well. All right, let me share my screen. If I could get a thumbs up, that's working. Great. It's working. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks for, so much for the invite. I'll be covering this session with Daniel, and we're really excited to bring forward a few as um as was quoted advanced tutorials um in 2d to 3d techniques and i guess i really wanted to maybe start off by adding to what neil was saying and um i am currently a research associate at the harvard laboratory of design technologies and co-founder of the design practice architag and I, I imagine like several of you in the audience uh, i do come from this architectural uh, background so i as Neil mentioned, I did study at the AA and worked for several years at Foster and Partners in London, which then brought me to um, this deeper dive into creative applications and machine learning at the GST and in the current practice. Um, I'm also I'm currently assisting Andrew Witt in his uh, in the course Neural Bodies at the GST, and I've taught several 2D, 3D, or some metaverse uh, machine learning. Uh, conference uh, workshops, uh, including here at the at Digital Futures, where we've taught uh, two of them. So I'm excited to share some of this work and uh, very curious to see what you guys you know, come up with after this. Okay, so just a little overview of what we'll cover today. Um, I'm going to start with a very brief introduction just to frame the work. Uh, we're going to jump straight into animations and 2.5 the uh, workflows. This is going to include Rhino and some Grasshopper. And we're going to end just uh, with a few remarks on one of the tools, which has been really interesting. It's called Pointy. It's quick and easy to use. So uh, it's great to start thinking about 3D applications in architecture. And then I'll pass it on to Daniel, uh, who's going to go deeper into 3D applications using some of the work we'll do in the first part. So I'll be maybe 45 minutes. Um, or so. All right. Um, I'm just going to briefly start. I think it's really important to frame um, these technical workshops uh, and how machine learning will increasingly affect design practices, and in particular within the space of 3D form generation. And what's particularly important to me is how language and semantics will find new values within our multimodal design processes. So it's important to really remember how multimodal processes in architecture are so central to the way we work and how we navigate almost non-linearly between these different modes from text to sketch, to image, to 3D, the physical or digital 3D models. And it's the convergence of these of text and image processing that really brought this ability for machine learning to be positioned and be a process which is aiding our current workflows. Uh, these, are, um, these are really defining how we can make personalized methodologies and workflows, and this is a factor where 
a space in which we can gain agency when uh, discussing how to integrate these models. So we can go from text to several different models and finally to the 3D form. So I'm just gonna unpack a very briefly a few of these tools and uh, just to name a few, this really begins with the image, something we've been discussing in the last, we've been discussing in the last few workshops. What can we do this? In this case, each plan, each generated plan can be spatialized and interpolated between one another. And through a process we will cover today, which is depth map reconstructions, each text, or in this case, red line sketch, materializes into a volume, establishing a set of spatial relations open for interpretation. The notion of a picture being worth a thousand words no longer, no longer stands in isolation, as a word or set of words is now word, worth a thousand pictures and forms. Other tools, um, which including some I've, I've been developing with Professor Andrew Witt at the GSD, include 3D generative models, which are reliant on this uh, problematic space of 3D data sets. In this case, we created a generated, we, uh, we generatively created that, that data set of minimal uh, surface shapes. We're increasingly moving beyond this into uh, 3D data sets, which are based on diffused images and not um, 3D data sets in, in specifically. So in this case, it's a model called point E, which we will cover today, how we can go from text to points to surfaces through uh, computational tools. Others include uh, text to mesh or dream fields in which we are gradually surpassing the points and going into more resolved yet slightly uh, not highly uh, with, without the highest resolution at this stage. However, may you in the later part will uh, prove us wrong and show how things are changing so much so fast. And the last one is really something we covered with Daniel and Carlos Navarro in a, the last week in the workshop with Cadria, uh, applying these diffusion models and giving greater control to a 3D nerf process and applying VFX, avatars, and more interaction and engagement with these tools. So ultimately, these models, um, that there are more mo as these as more models come out, they're becoming uh, much more and more versatile. With and within this process, we can gain more and more agency in asserting or personalizing, or what I call chaining these different models together. So we navigate between this idea of intuition and machine as a new norm, where we must establish always a feedback loop of information where designers maintain control over these AI processes in building the data and feeding the AI models and generating outputs. And then most importantly, through this act of curation and intuition, finally make the design. Okay, hopefully that framed um, very, very briefly how, where we are in 3D uh, form generation. It's definitely like uh, the big question within uh, architectural discipline, and um, I am confident we'll, we'll get there very fast, very soon. So it's great to, for you to be in these workshops and to start understanding the potential of these tools. Um, I'm going to focus uh, on animation. So how can we use a stable diffusion Google Colab uh, and how we can then move on to using this in Grasshopper and we'll move on the next part of the workshop with Daniel on animations. So maybe to introduce this before jumping straight into Colab, um, I'm, there's a question, why stable diffusion? So stable diffusion versus these other models, and these are, these are very much the latest models, as Midjourney v5 just came out, Dali Beta, Angelica has access to it, so kindly generated these images and stable diffusion the two. So you can see the comparison and stable diffusion surprisingly is at a graphical, um, it's not that far off from other models. And what's surprising is how it's completely open source. The models are checkpoints. And by using this Google Colab, we'll be able to access many more parameters than one might 
uh, in the paid services. So it gives us that flexibility, let's say. Stable diffusion, and uh, just to briefly mention, is a latent text to image diffusion model. It's supported by Stability AI and trained uh, on models by Lion. Um, okay, so the, this collab is great because it gives you this versatility. So this is just a really brief overview of what you can do in it. You can go from the, the, the input none, which simply means you can generate images from text or image inputs. You can generate 2, 2D and 3D animations. What that means is that you can start going from one frame to another and control the coherence, the camera location. So you can actually have these uh, interesting um, parameters, interesting control over uh, where you want to navigate in these generated scenes, which is really like a uh, an introduction to what's to come and what Runway has just launched as Gen 2, which is the text to video. Um, so the last part is you can add your own video and you can uh, then um, generate new videos with the text prompt. Okay, so we're going to jump into this collab. And I added a link uh, right here. It's a short link. So hopefully you can access it or go back. Maybe we can add these in the resources below after the workshop. And um, I'll just give you a sneak peek of what possibilities we can generate. And what's interesting is how in generating these, this introduces this idea of interpolating and navigating between spaces, for example, between exterior scenes and interior scenes with the same style, in this case, the possibly abused, possibly overused, uh, for a better word, um, prompt of Zaha Hadid. And interestingly, this could be used to navigate between different styles. So for more classical uh, prompts inspired by Palladio or Brunelleschi, uh, we navigate to more modernist approaches and gradually to and the Corbusier, and gradually to the a more modern, futuristic, or a Zaha approach. So this this interpolation, this navigation between these prompts or these styles, is something that really has you know, a great potential uh, within design discipline. Okay, I'm gonna jump straight into the collab. Um, for those who don't have the link right here i'm just gonna add a note you can put the link on the chat and you can put it on youtube if you want oh, oh that's great thanks so much that's the short link and that's the full link all right so this is um this collab is uh, was developed uh, by Stable Diffusion, uh, by, partly by st the Stability AI team. The forum is like an open source collaborative, um, let's say, network of uh, of people who've who've put this uh, Google collab out. Now, before jumping straight into this, uh, I'm aware some of you may not have used it before, and I believe it might have been mentioned in some of the past workshops, but just to give a very high level, uh, Google Colab, think of it as a Google Doc for code. Um, in this case, we're using, uh, it's essentially a Python-based Jupyter notebook uh, where one can collaborate. Imagine you can share it with your friends and you can both work on different parts of the code, create new cells uh, or debug at the same time. What's great about it is that, especially when training machine learning models, because they have very high GPU requirements, uh, it, it is difficult at times to run some models on your local PC. So what's great about these is that they run entirely on the cloud. Uh, there's different subscription models. You can get the free version, which usually gives you the NVIDIA T, uh, the T4 uh, GPU, which is completely fine to run on all of these workflows. Um, I'm running uh, slightly higher. Uh, GPU because I have a what's called the the pro account the Google the call that pro account 
Um, and I think that's generally it. The way it works is uh, as a first thing when you open the file, it's always good to open the folders to the side and make a copy in Drive. What that simply does is it gives you full access uh, to, it makes this file yours. And if you wanted to do one of the two things you can do here is I want to take my, my own notes. So you can feel free to write notes or like change the code or make it your, make it your own really. I've added a few resources along the way. Uh, so there's a few links you can use. Um, the second thing you want to do in runtime in change runtime type, sometimes this isn't, this isn't the case. You just want to make sure that's on GPU and likely with the free version, it will be on standard, which is completely fine. So this is the text input. The other one is code input. So we can see NVIDIA, you can put in any code, for example, uh, and it will generate, for example, in this case, we're asking it, what GPU do, did the cloud give me? And, and the last important thing, it's very common for errors to occur. And that the main reason is for things to have not been run sequentially. And I'll give you a very brief example. So if we were to, and with this understanding, this logic will help you run the whole Google Colab uh, with ease. So for example, you have two variables, x, x equals 10, y equals 20, and then x, then we can print the result, x plus y. If we were to generate the last cell with, without running the first two cells, it simply wouldn't run. If we were to run one and then run that one after without defining both variables, clearly it wouldn't work. So this just goes to show when you're running this, feel free to always go from top to bottom. And that's as, that's as much as um, I guess we'll need to cover from like how to run it. It's very intuitive. So essentially we're pressing this play button to run the cell. Okay. So the way this Google Colab works, at the very top, there is the general setup. Um, you're going to see what GPU you have. We are going to uh, set up the environments, and you can show the code. We're going to download. In this case, it's, it's all pre-done, so all you have to do is run each cell and set up the model paths. Generally, this will, many of these Google Colabs, they save the files on um, in the same folder. Within your drive, there is this folder called AI. So within this, you can see all these different models that I've run in the past. You would have the stable diffusion folder. So you can access all the files we generate. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump straight into the settings. And this is what I described. You have the animation modes as none. So image-based. 2D and 3D for animation based or video uh, for video inputs or interpolation, which is another interesting. We're just going to start with a basic hello world. World, Let's run all the cells. You can just press play on all of the cells. And this might take you guys a, little, a moment just to run and load all the dependencies. So I just give it a moment. And at the very bottom, you'll always have that preview of what you generate. In this case, it's futuristic city with canals by Zaha Hadid. And you can see it's maybe not the best resolution. And very quick fix to that is simply by changing the settings. And we'll go into uh, the actual parameters in a second. So you can generate higher resolution images. It might seem a little faster for mine because it's a slightly better GPU, but with the T4, everything runs great. So the outputs are pretty good. And as always, as have been, ha has been mentioned in previous, the semantic specificity of your text will give you more control and more agency in the output. So clearly, the more precise, the more those, of those fun data set words, hyper-realistic, 4K, um, the more of those you use, the better uh, your outputs will be. And it's very much a trial and error. So 
you have to be patient with them and, and learn how to uh, generate these prompts. Midjourney seems a little more forgiving in that regards. Okay, so the way it uh, generally works once we've set none, so we're generating a single image, is that we can add the single prompt. If we're generating a single image, the prompt, you're using this uh, cell right here. If you were generating animations, we would use the one below it. So we can, what these uh, numbers essentially mean is that from frame zero to 50, we would go from the first prompt to the second prompt. In this case, we have a modernist building by Norman Foster with many windows to an organic building by Zahadi. So we, we could like navigate between these two spaces. And if we continue through 100 frames, for example, we'd have, we would then go to the next. Um, okay, so since we generated a single image, let's just try to go to 2D. And 2D simply unlocks 2D translations. For example, I imagine you have a camera in space and you move gradually forward. I'll give you a simple example for that. Um, if we were to add a zoom rate of 1.005, which is kind of slow, but just to prove the point, at frame zero, from frame zero onwards, we would have a gradual zoom. So I'm just going to run after. And what we're doing is we're running, in this case, just 20 frames. 20 frames, since we have in the animation prompt set uh, from frame 0 to 50, we'll only generate the first prompt. So I do invite you to try to uh, change from none on the top in animations to 2D. And sim that simple change will help you generate some uh, interesting animations. So we have the more modernist building. What's great at the bottom, if you untick this button, skip for run all, is that you can then generate an, a video from those frames. It's great to remember that the outputs are always saved. So if you did want to go back to them, you can simply go in your folders, and find the folder. And to know what folder name you've decided, uh, right above in the settings tab, you have a batch name called DF Workshop. So you can change this to whatever folder you name, and it will be saved, as mentioned, within that stable diffusion um, folder. OK. So. Um, this is the general process of generating images. I'm just going to show you some other examples just to give you an idea of how this works generally. Uh, it is a very versatile tool, tool. So you can really, you can try out several different things. And here, this is what I'm showing. You can gradually zoom backwards or you can start seeing how it, this is just a, a just to show you can start moving, uh, turning that camera. And what's great is you can start adding functions, or uh, there's a link within the collab where you can start seeing the actual camera trajectory if you want to see within you know, how it's going to pan out. This is simply going from frame. This is. It's navigating between frames. It's, you see it's going forward, and at frame 30, it moves gradually left, and at frame 60, it gradually moves right. And just to briefly cover how that works is that as you have these translations in the same way with the text prompt, you can say from frame 0, there will be no translation. From frame 30 onwards, there will be a translation of one unit to the right in this case. And then if we can reverse that at frame 60, we can say there will be a translation one unit left. So you can start twisting and morphing and trying out how dif uh, these different images uh, are created. OK, very important for the second part uh, of this workshop 
is generate saving the depth maps. Saving the depth maps is um, oh, will help you generate. I'm just gonna run it all so that I can show you. We're gonna generate the image and the depth map. The depth map essentially gives you a black and white image where uh, it it dictates how the deep a space is based on trained images. So the darker the space, the farther it will be from the foreground and the lighter the space, the closer it will be the, to the foreground, or sometimes it's vice versa. So you can see here, the very bottom. Should be generating images. One important thing to consider with, with animation generation is simply to control the strength. The strength idea, uh, let's see. When I get lost, I, I sometimes just do a control F and I just write the string. string. So I will just search for whatever word or prompt that I want. Controlling the strength will determine the coherence between one image and another. So how, how similar are they? And I'll give you an example of that. So in this case, we have a strength of 0 0.5. The images have some form of coherence. However, you can see at the higher the strength, the more coherence. This is navigating between prompts. If that strength is really low, clearly every frame will be very different. Okay, so I welcome you all to test that animation setting. Um, try out some translations. And for the second part of the workshop, save the depth maps. By saving the depth maps, you will have, let's see if I can pull up the folder. You will have both the image and the depth, the equivalent depth map of each frame, which will be great for animations. Or if you want to take one particular still, uh, you can also do that. Let's see. Here we go. So you can see this is the this is the folder where everything is saving. So you have both the images and you can increase the resolution or the training steps as well, similar to every other um, model. And then you'll have the depth map. Clearly the bigger the resolution your image, the better your depth map will be. Okay, so how can we use this? Um, we can, I do invite you to try more with using this collab and there's several tools so it's kind of a space with it within itself and um, there's several tutorials online and uh, going through the forum as well so you can try like different steps different scales um, generating batch images inputting your own uh, you condition the outputs based on an image so that's the setting here um, and and so on so i just wanted to show how we could possibly use these since we're talking about 3d form how we could possibly bring these into uh, grasshopper for example now i'm gonna move on to grasshopper and see how we can take one of the frames from the image one of those depth maps and start generating um, start generating a 3D form, which we can begin manipulating and working with. Uh, one of the comments was to uh, show some resources and just to make it helpful, I have added at the very top here, and we have the, the forum quick guide. This is just like, a short guide on a slightly older deform model. What's great is the second one. The second one has, if you have any questions on any individual parameters, 
this is a great resource and it goes through, for example, what do those 3D animation setting mean? How can I rotate that camera and what or how do I orbit around? So this is the x-axis, y-axis. So if you have any very specific, because it I realize at times it can be slightly overwhelming to uh, navigate through all these different parameters, which is both. Uh, can you put the link of the site on the chat so I can put it on YouTube, please? Oh, yeah. Thanks. That's the link, yes. And the math one is if you maybe for more advanced users, if you want to try to add functions in here, it's kind of like an explanation of, you know, amplitude or how, how you can start like making the continuous, um, continuous scenes or more more organic shape and you can always use this uh, graph right here simply what you would do is in this case imagine you did want to use a function to animate from frame zero to frame 100 i wanted to to move like organically uh, you would simply just change the variables and um, you can just preview how how that might be and you can then uh, change it or see how how to improve that. It's just like a visual tool to help you for if you want to go deeper into it. But there's there's several tools, and I also added. Uh, I think there's another two resources right at the top. Great. All right, so I'm gonna jump into Grasshopper. Uh, I have, feel free to open it. I'm just going to briefly cover how this could be used and how could, how could we use this pixel information of a static 2D image applied with a depth map and start using, start getting these three forms and use these as like, as prompts to possibly go into a manual reconstruction or to reassemble them or take them as it is. And it's never a bad thing to always always go back to this manual process, even though there's this there's always a need there's always a curiosity to um, to use AI to get answers, let's say, from it. So it's always it's always good to be critical and bring it back. And this relates to the general discussion of agency and where we stand um, as architects. Okay, so. I am, let's see how I'm on time. Okay, I think I have a little bit of time. Uh, we're just going to do a quick walkthrough of how we could possibly extrude these images. And uh, hopefully, hopefully you can follow in. I'll add a bifocals as well so that you can see like, exactly what I'm doing. It's a very short. Uh, grasshopper definition, but I think it's really powerful, and you'll be able to compare what I'm doing in Grasshopper to the next process with that Daniel described. Compare like how uh, these different softwares uh, relate to one another. Okay, so what we want to do is generate um, a rectangle, map our image onto it, and then start extruding both uh, the depth map and then project the texture onto it. And um, let's see if we can go cover it uh, step by step. Um, I'm going to just simply start by making a rectangle. And this shouldn't be too, this shouldn't be complicated. Let's see, Okay, so what we want to do is we start with a rectangle and we want to just simply convert it into a mesh, which we can then subdivide into uh, different numbers, uh, subdivide equally into uh, different numbers of U's and D's. So what we're going to do is map onto this the depth map. So now we have we'll have vertices upon which to apply that color value. Um, image. Okay, so we're going to take two image samplers. 
One is going to be for the depth map, which you will take from stable, the stable diffusion animation. You have two frames, and later Daniel might cover more animations, how we can use them all. First, we'll input the image, whichever you select. We're going to um, reparameterize it, and we're going to keep it RGB. The second one will simply be um, importing the depth. So the other one, reparameterizing it and uh, changing the value so it, it recognizes that it's not an RGB scale, but it's a uh, black and white scale. Okay, so what we want to do is use this black and white scale to offset the Z value. By offsetting the Z value, for example, the white will have very little offset. And you can see that right here. We want the black, the foreground, to really stand out. So what we're going to do is we're going to move, let's say, in one direction, the Z axis for now. Uh, we are going to... We're going to, um, before we do that, we need to deconstruct. We need to take the vertices from this mesh that we created. And feel free to change the dimensions so you have a little more control. Clearly, Grasshopper comes with the limitation of speed. And so we're going to take these vertices and we're going to translate them based on uh, that's RGB value. So we're going to translate that into the Z direction uh, mapped onto those vertices. And first part, you can't really see uh, a change. So what we'll have to do is just simply multiply multiplication. We just have, simply have to augment that so that we can have a, a much more accentuated, let's say, from zero to 800, as an example. So we're actually going to take those values and see what happens. And you can start seeing uh, an abstracted form of how this uh, might actually look. And it will become clear in just one second. Uh, we might just want to rotate. Rotate the geometry by along the C. So we'll keep the as it is. And what we want to do is then take these values and simply rebuild it, rebuild that original geometry. So we'll take the, you know, we'll take the, uh, let's see. The, faces and we'll take the vertices which have been mapped um, from the depth map and then we'll color it with the original texture and color C is color right at the bottom so we'll take those values at the very top so this is kind of like a very abstracted depth map which we can bake Let's see. In other cases, I would like to rotate this, tidy it. What's great is that we can smooth in this geometry. I think it's upside down. Uh, so what we have is that is a three <laughs> is what we call a two point five D geometry. Turn table. So you can kind of see how it's like. Um, you have that dimensionality to it it's not perfect what we can do in grasshopper is then smooth in this geometry or do simple operations and let's see this is a more complete version where we can you can see how we can let's see from the back we can smooth in these and clearly for the workshop i'm using low values but you could increase the values to increase your control within this process Okay, so that's the hopefully a high level overview, and you can try to recreate this or make these this your own. Clearly, there's there's ways in Grasshopper of animating these or uh, using different images and combining them. 
Um, I do want to, uh, since the cover image of the workshop today was point E, I do want to end maybe on spend very few minutes describing the text to 3D process as let's say a hello world exercise. Hopefully I'm not running too fast. And clearly these, these are things we could cover many hours or many workshops on. There's so many different things and potentials within the tools. Um, I do want to stick within 45 minutes. So I'm going to share my screen. And this is, this is an example of an animation. You can start being a little more creative of converting those vertices into points, adding those that RGB color information onto it, putting a dolly camera into it, or uh, several different things. Uh, clearly, there's uh, the next step, as um, Carlos has described in a previous workshop, is having greater control and helping you use controlment, and that'll be very much with stable diffusion. I'm sure that's uh, that's definitely you know, an interesting next step. Okay, so point E uh, is, an, is another model uh, made by OpenAI, uh, made open source. It's uh, was for paper written in December. Here at the very bottom, there are two links if you want to get more information on it. And at a very high level, this model first generates a synthetic, a single synthetic image. So same as the other processes, we're going from text to image, to generate an image. And then it uses, um, through this process, it uses a, a text-guided diffusion model called Glide. And it then uses um, a second diffusion process to produce a 3D point cloud, which is conditioned on that original input image. So these are just a few outputs of what you can generate. The benefit of this model is in inference time. It takes, let's say, 60 seconds to maybe two minutes maximum to go from text to these over 4,000 points, which have that se semantic resemblance of your original input. It is wildly powerful. Clearly, it comes with its limitations. The outputs are trained, are, the results can be are more promising towards common objects, tables, chairs, corgi, dogs, apparently, um, planes, tables. However, um, there, are, there are ways in which you can have an image input, or you can really be specific with your, with your text to be more, let's say, creative. And here's just like an example of some of the text tests I've, do, I've done to just uh, demonstrate how there is a great opportunity, even from points alone, even with these very let's say simple models uh, like without even going to dream fusion or nerfs or other models. And uh, this is just uh, an example of how you can manipulate that surface uh, and then generate some interesting shapes or forms. Okay, we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna fly through this, but it's more to show you what is possible and give you those tools to then test it on your own. Uh, and I'm going to wrap up after that. So I'll share this link. This is a Google Colab I put together. Um, and I shared it. I'm sharing it in the chat. Um, Jelika, if you want to share. But essentially, sure. we're to thinking. Um, I've tried to simplify it as much as possible. And same installation process. We're going into the same folder. We see what GPU you have, A100. In your case, it'll likely be an A4. We're loading the dependencies, uh, the libraries all required for this model. And then after that setup happens, is we're going into the same similar parameters, however, for 3D. In this case, I've, I've added a prompt of a blue chair, highly detailed. And you can start seeing, um, let's say, different uh, examples of that chair is mapped. What's great is, with this tool, I've also added uh, ways in which you can export the PLY points, so that point cloud. You can also try to export um, 
Uh, you can also try to export the actual geometry. And I've added just a few tools. So uh, you can uh, export the point cloud. You can export, um, this is simply like exporting it straight onto your local. Um, and then you could, the last one is to actually, uh, it uses a marching cube algorithm. It's not as good as I would say the process using Grasshopper are. I do invite you to just try exporting these. And I'll give you just a brief example of what these might look like, and then I'll I'll try to end it there. Um, so if you run those all, um, you can you can see the types of outputs and uh, hopefully you get some interesting results and we'll we'll show you how these can be used also in the second part. I'm just gonna open it and show you a very brief way of using this with Grasshopper. So here's the lovely blue chair, <laughs> which today is a chair, but tomorrow is a very high resolution model. And the first step is clearly to explode those points so that you have control over them. And then we're going to scale it and use a Grasshopper plugin called Dendro. Dendro is a great tool in which you can do surface reconstructions from points. And the reason we're not using a marching cube algorithm is that it, it gets very jittery. And, um, but it goes to show that everyone, we all should introduce our own workflows to test these out and try out how it works best. And, you know, so I'm just going to scale it and then give you a quick preview of what this might look like just and wrap it there. It is slightly big. There are about 4,000 points, I believe. So yeah, 4,096 points. Oops. It just takes one moment and then on. So we have a scaled version, and I'll show you why I scaled that in a moment. Oops. Press the wrong button. Okay, so we have the points. We need Grasshopper, and I'll just preview a pre made definition. And if Feel free to mimic it or copy it, and we could add it to the resources after. Okay, so version point E. All right, very simple definition, and you can try to recreate it. It uses this plugin called Dendro. Dendro has this great tool of going from points to volume. So all we're gonna do in, while recreating this is select the points, right click on the points, set multiple points, and hopefully we will have nice, clean geometry. So you clearly there's several parameters and you can control the radius. And you can kind of see how this works really based on these individual points, which it's kind of averaging out. And you can apply these smooth volumes, these other controls to kind of um, smooth that mesh or make it, uh, make it how, whatever resolution. Uh, hopefully that has kind of covered, uh, given you a little intro of what we're really embarking into this this exciting world of text to 3D, which for us architects is clearly um, the next big step. And I'm really excited to see what Mayur has to present. I'm happy to take any questions and hope that was helpful. Thank you. It was great. I wanted more, but <laughs> maybe another time. Thanks a lot, yeah. There's a lot more. There's so much more. Thanks, George. Yep. That, was, that was amazing. No, no, I, I, we should move on, I think, to, to go to Daniel to uh, 
uh, for the next step. That was great, George. We're going to have questions at the end, I think. Um, great. Okay. Um, so I'll go ahead. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to be sharing a part where you can also take uh, the original depth maps and images that uh, George produced from uh, the forum. Um, and I'm going to go through like similar process and then bring those generated point clouds into Blender uh, for an animation. Um, and this is a collab uh, that I can share. I'll share in the chat. Okay, so um, uh, this collab, uh, what it essentially does is going to take uh, the images that George generated from the forum, uh, and there's going to be two folders. There's going to be the name of the folder, uh, and there's going to be where your uh, RGB images, the original RGB images exist, and then where your depth map images exist. And then this is like the folder name for the point clouds. Um, and so what we're going to do is going to take the original RGB images and the depth maps and then combine them uh, to generate some point clouds. Uh, now, this process is a little bit different than what George did in Grasshopper, where this one takes into account uh, the geometry generated by a pinhole camera. Uh, so what happens with a pinhole camera is that you have your uh, 2D plane and then the 3D world. And the way the cameras works is like they take the 3D world and get a guest projected back into a 2D plane, uh, into like pixel space. And then by doing that process, uh, you can apply a function, like a mapping function uh, that can do the reverse. So if you have the image, uh, you can project that back into 3D world. Um, so the way that this collab works is that you can run it by going through a pair of folders, and this is just going to connect you to your Google Drive. So if you have your Google Drive connected, this is going to pop out a window. Okay, and it's going to pop up this window and this is going to connect to your Google Drive. So you just hit connect to Google Drive, um, click your email, and then allow. And then that's going to slowly connect to your Google Drive. Okay. So once it's mounted, you can just keep uh, hitting the next cell. So you can hit this cell. It's going to install the dependencies that we're going to use um, to generate the point clouds. Uh, and then in the next step, prepare folders. Uh, there's a group folder, and I'll show you what that is. And then the folder name, the where the RGBs are located, and the depth points or the depth maps. Um, and if we go to the Google Drive, We can go here, and this is like the main folder. Uh, this is the folder that George outputted from his uh, the forum tutorial. Um, and you can go, for example, you have your PNGs or your RGB files. So the sequence of images. And then you have your depth maps. So your sequence of depth maps that match the images. Okay, and then I'll show the original video the reference. So this is the original video produced from the forum. Um, and we're only gonna take like the 
few frames from that, so like 50 frames from that, to bring into uh, Blender um, and use those point clouds with those frames to create an animation. Okay. And then show the final animation. So this would be the final. This would be the final animation after uh, we run the process in Blender. So we'll go back to the collab. Okay, so now that you have your dependencies, your folders, uh, and your uh, folders names in the right place, um, you can run this. This is gonna spit out uh, the length of the images in each folder. Uh, and then here it's kind of for reference, the idea of this uh, camera projection matrix and how it works. Uh, I added a link here for reference, so you can check that out to see more. And then once you have that, then you can just hit play to this one. Uh, there's a sample size parameter here. So this one is gonna take 50,000 points. Uh, so this is just to reduce uh, the number of points that you're gonna be playing with in Blender. Uh, and this is just to make it easier uh, depending on your hardware so you can like modify this. Uh, the number of frames, so we're only gonna use 50. And then uh, FOB is just fill the view. Uh, and this parameter is going gonna, is gonna to change the camera projection matrix. So you can modify this. And then on this parameter, it's either going to um, spread back uh, the depth. Uh, so this is like the way to bring 2D into 3D uh, in an accurate way using this uh, camera uh, angle. Uh, so by messing with this parameter, you can modify that. Uh, so I'm going to keep it at 30. And then once you have that, then it's gonna run and it's gonna start uh, generating the point clouds and it's gonna tell you here where they're gonna be uh, saved. Uh, and th these are uh, .poy files. Uh, so once you have that, it's gonna start outputting these images and these images are just for references to see that it's working. Uh, you have the X axis view here, the Y axis view and the top axis view. Uh, and you can see kind of like how the projection is being done uh, from the 2D plane onto uh, the Z uh, or the depth plane, the Z plane. And you can just let it run and it's gonna save out into the folder. Uh, once you have that, you can hit this cell here, zip points folder and download. Uh, and it's just gonna zip, zip all those files and it's gonna download them automatically onto your uh, desktop. Okay. Uh, so once you have that, uh, then you can go grab your fol uh, folder, you download a folder, unzip it, and it's gonna, it's gonna be several folders in there. Uh, and then they're gonna be all saved here in sequential order. Uh, and these are all five files. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna open up Blender. And you're gonna create a new collection. And a collection is kind of like being able to put all those files into a, a folder, let's say, that you're gonna read from. So it's everything's it's like organized. Um, and then you're gonna go to import, uh, stanford.ply files. And then you're gonna go into that folder and select all those files and then just import fly. And, and that should take a little bit of time because of the file size and depending on your hardware on your computer. Okay, so like one thing about Blender, Blender is an open source uh, 3D modeling platform. Um, and it's pretty useful, it does a lot of things. Uh, so and it's like a free platform. 
Uh, and then you can just go to the Blender website here to download uh, the most recent version. And you can check about like more of the things that it can do. Uh, so it's great. I think it's, it's open source, it's free. Uh, it has a lot of functionality. Um, there's people doing like really cool stuff with it, uh, whether it's like animations or uh, doing like movie reels or sculpting or modeling, uh, compositing, um, animation and rigging. So it's pretty useful. It has a lot of uh, very interesting tools inside of it. There's also like Blender add-ons or like plugins that you can also use. Um, so we, it's pretty useful to use in these settings and be able to create uh, quick, uh, quick things pretty fast. Uh, the great part about it is that um, it has certain properties that allow you to make uh, instances pretty fast. Uh, usually faster, I would say a lot faster than like something like Grasshopper. Um, so that's why uh, it, it's a pretty useful tool in, in that regards. So for example, now that I have my point clouds loaded, um, Now that I have my point clouds loaded here, uh, they're going to be in this folder. So you can kind of like see them that they're now in there. Uh, and there's like a set of files. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this collection or this folder, and we're going to go through each one of these uh, to create like an animation. Uh, the way that is done is that there is a tool here called Geometry Nodes. Uh, and what you can do is you can select this geometry, for example. And create uh, something similar to like a grasshopper script. Uh, it's a little bit different than grasshopper, but, but it has the same functionality of being able to do visual programming. Uh, so you can start from a node and keep passing down the data until you get to like a final result while modifying it on the way. Um, and the way to go about it is that you can start, for example, in, in this case, since we're doing something a little bit more unique where we're gonna animate each frame one at a time and we have individual files in this collection folder, we have to figure out a way to like iterate through all of those files and pull the geometry and then delete it and then pull the next frame and then delete it. Uh, so we have to do a little bit of uh, indexing and a little bit of uh, ordering of that process. And after you do that, then you can transform the geometry uh, however you want. Uh, there's, I will explain this in a little bit, but there's some ways to like modify it and add some um, animations and texture to it. Uh, so to do this process, I'm not sure how to ship the files through here, but I guess, um, Okay. Uh, here's the link. If you go inside that link, uh, there's a few sample files uh, and there's some stuff that I've done. So this is like another type of animation that you can do. Uh, so Blender is pretty powerful in those respects. And then if you go into this folder, um, there's a Blender file here called uh, work sample, workshop sample file. Uh, you can download and it'll have everything that I'm doing now and it'll have this script undone. Um, so I'm just gonna go a little bit over the UI. And if you, once you open up Blender, uh, there's a tab on the right here that has kind of like your scene objects and this contains like all your objects, including cameras, uh, geometry, and any other item, like the collections. Um, there's also here on this side, it's kind of like where you have your basic uh, tools. So like your view, which if you click on it, it'll tell you like uh, things about your focal length, your view length, clip start and end. I usually set this up to around 10,000. Uh, if you hit this button here, which is pretty useful, uh, this is like the tackle to camera view. Uh, so if you hit it, it's gonna take you to like that camera view. Um, and if you have like an animation of some sort, 
it's gonna like follow secret flows. It's gonna show you kind of like the camera, what's going on in the camera view. Um, and then to be able to toggle between like the view shading mode, uh, you can go here. Uh, this is to make it X-ray. So this is gonna make everything visible or wireframe through. Uh, this here is a type of viewport shading. Uh, so you can change this, this one is plain color. Uh, this one would add the material inside of it. And then this one here is like a rendering, a real-time rendering color. Uh, so this one takes a little bit of time and to uh, show up, but if you have a, a strong computer, you might be able to get this faster. Um, okay, so I'm gonna stick to this one for now, so it's faster. And then once you do that, so one thing about like the point clouds, it's like once you import them into Blender, um, there's like a way to visualize them. And Blender has this feature for like the rendering engine where it usually opens up at B. Um, and if I hit that, EV, unless you have, <clears throat> unless you have the geometry already instantiated in Blender, uh, it won't work with just like the fly file. So you have to like change it to cycles. And cycles allows you to like visualize um, the point clouds. Uh, so once you have that changed, then it should be good. And then there's some properties here for the rendering. <clears throat> so the sampling here uh, under viewport, this is like your max sample. So this is only when you turn your shading, your viewport shading into this mode, into this like real time rendering mode. And that's how many samples it's going to uh, run through to be able to visualize the image in real time. Um, under that, uh, it says render noise threshold. This is like how much noise you want in the image. So you can like turn it down. This is a pretty good setting already. Uh, and max samples. This is like when you start rendering an image. Uh, this is how many samples it's going to take. The more you increase it, the higher quality the image will come out. Okay. So once you have that, the other thing is, for example, we want to add a camera. So by hitting Shift A, uh, it pops out this menu, uh, and you can go to camera and click on it, and it's going to populate a cam camera here. So like you can see it in this tab here. This camera 001. Um, and then if you want to go find it, because the scene is too big, you can go to view and then go to uh, frame selected. And then it'll take you to the camera point. Okay. And then you can just delete it if you're not going to use it or use another one. Um, okay, so that's one part. The other side here on the left side. Uh, so you have like kind of your regular tabs here. Uh, these are uh, tabs here specific to Blender. So you have your layouts, kind of like your main modeling space. Um, and then you have sculpting, modeling, UV editing, this is 2D images, texture paint, shading. It's usually like if you want to add materials to it, that's kind of like its own uh, viewport and its own uh, menus here. Uh, animation, rendering. Uh, then I'm going to go through this uh, and then geometry nodes. Uh, geometry nodes kind of like where you would do, let's say, something similar to like grasshopper uh, definition. Uh, and one way to do it is like if you create an object. So if I hit shift A and then I go to mesh and then I go to cube, uh, it's going to create cube here. And uh, for example, if you go to uh, layout for a second, you can take this cube. So this is like your base geometry, let's say. And then if you hit tab, uh, it pops out on the left side here, some properties or some uh, transformations that you can do with it, too, like typical geometric transformations. So for one example, um, you can play around with this, but you can do inset faces. So if you hit on that, uh, it pops out this circle, and then you can like pull, select a face. So one way to select a face is up here on this tab. Uh, there's a point, there's an edge, and then there's a face. So you can click the face, and then select that face, and then drag this, and then it'll modify. Uh, and then what you can do is select 
that face or like click on it and you can hit delete and then you can just hit uh it'll give you some options you can say faces and it'll delete that face uh so that's like a quick way to modify and then you can use this geometry to instantiate it in part of this uh overall let's say points uh cloud Okay, so I'll go back to this one. And then, okay, so now we can get like a base geometry. We have the point clouds imported. So they're all here. Uh, and these are like 50 frames that we have. So we want to now create like a geometry node definition to iterate through each one of them uh, and generate an animation. Uh, so one <clears throat> article about it is that <clears throat> you have to create like a sort of um, object outside of it uh, where you can uh, run the geometry's node definition. So you can't run it directly on the collection or on the points itself. It has to be referenced outside of it because you're going to be running through a collection. And, and that's kind of like a property of Blender. Uh, I'm not sure why it works that way, but it's kind of like a way to go about it. So for example, if I create another cube, okay, so I can take this cube and then I'm gonna go to it and under here, my geometry notes tab, and you can like click on this button here and it'll go geometry note header. Uh, you can hit new, and that'll pop out with this uh, these nodes, right? Similar to Grasshopper, uh, and then you can start modifying this and create like a definition. Um, so one way to go about it is like you just take the one that I created and like copy it over, and I'll go through each one of the steps. Uh, so I'll run it on that one again. Delete these, copy. Okay. okay, so now I copy that definition and I'm going to go through each of the parts. Uh, and one way to get the uh, to populate this with nodes, uh, you can do the same command, so shift A. And it's going to give you like this menu and over here it's kind of like all the individual nodes that you can uh, pull out so if you go to curves like with your curves curve typology it's another type of curve and then geometry is kind of like the typical one geometry and some operations within those geometries uh instances is related like if you want to place instances on a point uh material this can set the material types there's meshes so you can go through all of these and just check out the different uh, utilities that it has. Um, so for the first part, it's once you have that, you can right click, for example, and then go here, and then you can just type collection info. And, and this button here, what it's doing is that it's gonna check, you can hit it here. So it'll check like which collections are currently available in your scene. Uh, so we put the points here, collection number two, so you can like click on it. Uh, and then you can hit separate children and reset children. This is just kind of to make it, um, so all the things inside of it are separated, so they're unique items. Once you have that, you can send that into uh, realized instances, but we don't have to use this now. Uh, you can just go straight into capture attribute. Um, what capture attribute node does is that it'll take this, geometry from inside of the collection and, and is going to take something, some sort of attribute from in there. In this case, there's some options here. Uh, what we're going to select is the instance uh, because the way that it works here is that each of these point clouds, they're going to be uh, created as an instance. And then finally here, uh, we're going to select an index value. Uh, and the index value, what it does, is just going to iterate through all of the indices within this list. So it's going to create an index for each of these items. So it will start from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, till 50. And, and it will pull that attribute into here. 
So this is your outputs. So it outputs the geometry and it outputs the attributes and the attribute would be the index. Once you have that, then you have your scene time and this is a way to animate uh, the scene. So uh, you can use frame, which means that it's gonna take the frame number, so zero to 50, and you can set that frame at the bottom here. So start is at zero, end is at 50, um, and it's gonna go from zero to 50. So each frame, so number seven, for example, if it, this is like your current frame. So for number seven, if it's at number seven, that means that the frame here is value seven. And then you can compare that against your index value from the collection items. And if it's not that value, then delete everything else. And there's this note here called delete geometry, and it's gonna be operating on instances. So you, you gotta select your instances and you plug in your geometry and then your pooling operation, which is just gonna mask those uh, indices that are not uh, active as frames. Once you have that, you can apply a transform. And this is like, if you wanna modify the geometry, so you can take that geometry that is now uh, indexed out. So if you hit, if you see here, it says geometry is, is one. So it's only one point cloud that is activated. Uh, you feed that forward, and then you can modify the rotation, the scale, um, and any other kind of like translation that you wanna do. Once you have that, uh, then you can go to uh, this other node called mesh to points. Uh, what mesh to points does is it'll take that point cloud and it'll convert it into vertices and extract those points out. Uh, the reason why is that when you import the point cloud, it has to be in Blender has to be converted into a mesh, and those points or like points in the point cloud are treated as vertices. Um, but to be able to modify those or add instances to it. Um, you have to convert it into uh, points. This node here, once you get the points, you can pass them on uh, and into merge by distance. This is just a way to reduce the geometry. Um, and you can set your parameter here. So I have it as one meter, uh, but this it'll take the closest points and combine them together. Uh, so this is just a way to decrease the amount of points that you have. After that, um, you can go to instance to points instance on points and this takes in your points your original points and it'll take an instance and it also has some properties uh, rotation and scale there's also some selection properties and this, this is kind of like a way to select which instance you want i'm not going to go through that here but you can uh, definitely look at it on youtube um and then what, it, what we can do is we can either uh add this node object info uh, and what object info does, for example, is that it'll take any object inside of uh, your Blender scene. Uh, in my case, I have a cube, and this is this cube here that I created originally. Um, but you can change it to any other object. Uh, so, for example, if I want to create a icosphere or a, let's say let me do a cone, it's a little bit different. So I have this cone and then it's here, cone. I'm gonna add an Intuit cone instance. Okay, and if I go back to this, uh, it says object info, I'm gonna select that cone so it'll replace the current instances there. And if you see here, that cone is now as placed as an instance. So you can see like how fast it is in comparison to Grasshopper, where I have close to a million points. I actually not, I should have 50 million points, but plus the geometry of the cone itself, it ups up to like close to uh, 900,000 vertices. And you can kind of see the cones here. Uh, 
Uh, so you can kind of you can create your own geometry and then you can reference it from here. So whatever instance you want to add, uh, whether it's a cone or any other type of geometry, you can just reference it here. And then this geometry plugs into instance. And then you take those instances uh, and then you go to uh, at this node, realize instances. That just kind of populates the geometry and makes it uh, useful. So you can modify it and add color to it. And you can take that geometry now that you have all these cones, let's say, these instances, and set material to it. Uh, one way to go about the material is that you can go to that original geometry here. So that original geometry uh, where we instantiated the geometry nodes uh, definition, and you can go to shading. And then if you go to, And if you go to Shane and you select that geometry that you created, um, you can add here on this right panel, uh, hit the plus and it'll add a material slot. And then it'll pop out this uh, graph. Uh, the way to create this graph is that you can also use Shift A and then search and then input your uh, principal BSDF, which is just a way to uh, create the color. Uh, this here, the hue saturation value in gamma, these are ways to just modify the color so we can increase the saturation so it's a little bit more vivid um, or decrease it, right? Uh, and then one key part about this is you have to add this attribute node. And the attribute node, what it's going to do, it's going to take the, the color property from those point clouds. So the point clouds get uh, imported as, as a Live file, which contains uh, seven properties. Uh, and I'll show it here in geometry nodes. So the seven properties for the point cloud is the precision, so your X, Y, Z coordinates, and then your uh, call attribute, which is uh, three numbers, so your RGB values, and your uh, alpha value, which is a one, so it's opacity. Um, and then under shading, you just have to add this attribute to your color. Um, and the way to do that is you go here, you can do search and then attribute, and then geometry, and then here under name, you can just type in call, and that should pull that color property from like the point clouds. Uh, and then you can just plug it into your uh, principal PSDF and then add any other sort of modifications between that and the principal SDF. Once you have that, you can plug this into your output and on your surface. And this you create the colors for each of those individual points. And you can see here it colors every single instance uh, matching the original point cloud. OK. And once you have that, uh, you can go to set material. And then under set material, you connect your geometry. Uh, you hit this button here. And then you just select that material that you created with those uh, attributes. And it should color the, the geometry as so. Uh, once you have that, then you can kind of manipulate and kind of make the geometry a bit. Uh, one way to do that is to use a node called set position. And set position takes in the geometry, a selection, and then position and offset. And the way to go about this is that you have to add this node here, uh, so the position node. And this one is just kind of like telling this node that. We're just going to use a position property uh, to be able to move the points around, let's say. Um, and then you can add these textures. Uh, and the way these textures works, it's kind of like adding noise. So they have like different properties uh, and they have like the menus here. And so you can play around with that. Uh, you can change the scale. Let's say, for example, a Voronoi texture. And the cool part about this is that you can start from Voronoi, plug whatever um, noise or uh, modifications this add, plug it into like another texture, which is like a noise texture, plug it into here, that, that different sort of movement to it. Uh, and then you can add these vectors here. Um, so for example, this node here is add and it's gonna take the vectors from the color texture here. 
uh, modify and replace, and then you can add a multiplier node to multiply the degree to which that is going to uh, modify, um, let's say, like a movement in these points. So in this case here, if I go to, okay. So here on the right, if you select that original cube, um, under this tab here, on the right side, it says modifier properties. Uh, this here is like your geometry nose definition to that object. And then there's some properties here that says noise scale. So you can like modify this. I slide in, I don't know if it's gonna make that much difference, but you can also modify this one here. And this is, this should tell it like how to move in that time. Uh, so this one is set by a frame. So depending on the frame that it's on, it's gonna make some sort of uh, movement. And you can play around with these properties here. So like scale, detail, and that should automatically like generate some sort of movement for these points. Okay. Um, and then once you have that, uh, then you send this geometry to a group output node and that should create uh, the full out geometry now that it's to, so it could be useful. Okay. Okay, so now that we have that geometry instantiated, uh, now we can do is two things. We can either set a camera path, um, for example, here, or we can input our own camera at some point and just watch an anime um, like this, uh, where I inputted a camera and it'll create that original animation I showed earlier. So it's gonna go through each of those frames, like if you see the frames is moving here, uh, and it's gonna iterate those frames and the point clouds, and it's gonna change them accordingly in 3D space with the instantiated geometries at the point. Okay, and you can kind of see the final result here, or like some sort of result. Okay, so I'll show a quick way to create a camera path. Um, so one way about it is if you hit Shift A, you need a curve to, to put the camera on. Um, so Shift A and then curve, and then you can go to circle, right? Uh, you won't see it because it comes up pretty small, but if you hit the uh, letter S, uh, it should scale. Like you see these two arrows there. Uh, and you can drag those arrows out. And that'll create like your curve. Uh, and then you can hit uh, G. And G is for moving. Uh, and if you hit any of the axis letters, so X, Y, Z, uh, those are like the directions that you can move. It's kind of like snap into those axes and then you can move it in those axes. Um, so for example, I want to move the camera, like put, oh, the circle closer to the center of the geometry. I can hit Y and then I can just move it in that Y axis. Okay. And then once you have that, let's say that curve to, uh, for the camera to follow it along, um, you can create another camera, let's say, and then hit camera. And then it'll create this camera here. And I'm going to call it, you hit the camera and you can change the name. So path camera. And then if you hit this camera and you scroll down to the properties tab here, you can go to this um, menu here. So it, this is like up your object constraint. And this is like, so you can set the camera to uh, to track to some sort of curve, follow a path, or to track an object. So we can hit follow path, uh, and this is a target, and then you can select that uh, uh, circle, and the camera should be tracking to that circle here. So it's now following the circle. 
Um, and then you can say here, follow curve, anyway, path. And then like you can kind of see now uh, that the camera's pointing the wrong way. So we wanted to track some point or to be able to uh, be constrained to like a point. Uh, and then what you can do is you can add another property called track to, and you can just go up here and then say track to, and we need a target. So here it, uh, it says target. So we need a target. Uh, we can create a target by using, we can either use geometry or we can create an object called an empty. So if you do shift A and then you go to empty and then play an axis. Um, and we can say this is target cam. And now we got to find it. So to find it, you select the object and then you go to frame selected. So, and if I want to move it, G, let's say I want to move it up, C, G and C, and then that moves it up, G, Y, that moves it in the Y axis. So that's our, our tracking target. And if we go back to the camera, the path camera, we can then go back to this property here, track to and select that. And select that target cam. And you see it makes like a line to that uh, empty object from the camera viewpoint. So now the camera is going to track that object. Um, so if you want to put that empty object kind of like inside of the geometry, we can do again G and then Y the object, and then you can see the camera is tracking it. Uh, now, the way to visualize what the camera is looking at and to see what uh, animation is doing, uh, you can go back to um, here, this property step, and then we have to change the current active scene camera to that new uh, created camera. So if you go here, uh, this little uh, scene uh, property, and then you go to camera and then you say camera and select the path camera. Okay, now that's your main scene camera. And then if you go to this menu here and you go to this camera, it'll take you to that camera's perspective. Uh, so now we can then, what we can then do is hit play and see if that camera's moving. So you can see that now the camera is moving around that circle and uh, facing directly towards that empty object. And that is one way to create a camera movement and to be able to generate the enemy. And as the camera is moving, you can see that the point cloud is switching from frame to frame uh, and it's moving around and you can see it from like the exterior of the side. Okay. Uh, so once you have that, uh, you can modify the camera parameters, um, like if you depend on, on your, say your field of view and your location. So if you hit the camera again, and you go to this tab here with like little camera, uh, there's your camera parameters. So it says like lens type, the focal length. So this is like, do you want 50 or do you want to reduce it to maybe 30? That gives you more field of view. Um, and then, uh, one nice part about this is that there's a property here under viewport display called uh, passer part out. If you increase the, this, it kind of blocks out uh, or like it darks out the, the areas of the screen where like the camera's not facing. So you can kind of see what the camera's looking at more directly. Um, so that's like some properties that you can play with. So that's the basic setup to create like a animation or like frame animation with the camera and the point class animated. And then if I want to render this out, um, oh, one thing to add is that like we can also add lights. Uh, the way to add lights, you can also hit shift A and then go to light and you can add a point light, a sun or a spotlight or an area light. Area light, it's kind of like a rectangle. Uh, sun is like, uh, it lights the whole scene. Uh, in this case, I have a sun here, and you can like move it around. 
uh, and you can set the properties here for the sun. I, I, this case is set to 15, but you can play around with that. And then that's pretty much your whole scene. So if we look at it and change our shading to like the real time. Uh, you can kind of see the geometry with the light. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention, but that's really important, it's like in this tab here in the view, depending on how big your geometry is, you uh, under focal length and clip star and end. Uh, this uh, end here, you might want to increase it. So maybe add like another zero in case your geometry is too big uh, and just uh, make it larger depending on your geometry. But that would tell you, um, or like that, that tells you like where it's clipping the image. Okay, and once you have that, you can go here to, okay, you can go back to this tab here. Uh, so this is like your output settings for like the rendering or animation. Uh, and under format, you can set the resolution. So in my case, I'm doing 512 by 512, but you can make this bigger. Um, and then frame rate is like your frames per second. So in this case, it's 24. Frame range, uh, this is like in regards to your timeline. So your animation, so we said only 50 frames per point cloud. So we're just gonna go from zero to 50 and it steps by one. Uh, and then here on output, uh, this is where you pick the folder that you wanna save out your animation. So you can like hit this button and then create like your own folder anywhere. And then just, uh, for example, I'm just gonna go right click a new folder and then new animation. And then hit a set and it's gonna, uh, it's gonna put that as your output path, save file extensions and then for file format, I'm just gonna hit PNG and then everything else should be okay. Uh, once you have that, then you can go to render and then render animation or render image. So this part here, when you hit render image or render animation, this is gonna be using whatever camera you set here for your uh, scene camera. So just double check that to make sure that you selected the correct camera. And one way to check is by going here and then going to this part here, like the little camera, and then just hitting it. And then you say, okay, I want this camera, so this works. And then I can go here and now I can go to uh, render animation. And then once you hit render animation, it should automatically start generating some sort of rendering frame and it'll take some time, um, depending on how many samples and how big your uh, pixel uh, resolution is. And that's pretty much like a basic way to get an animation with point clouds in Blender, all right? All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Neil? Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. It's great. Um, Maya, we got we go with Maya and Barbara. Are you ready to to uh, present? Share your screen. Mm, yes. Can you let me know if you can see, please? Yes. Yeah. Amazing. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Barbara Villanova. I am the co-founder of 3D Guru AI. I'm joined here by Mayur Mistry, who will be coming in a minute. Uh, he's an engineer in design technologies, who's also my co-founder. And first, I'd like to thank uh, Digital Futures for the opportunity to present our work between such an exciting group. Uh, 3D Guru is an AI-powered 3D design productivity tool. It's a software on the web that enables architects and interior designers to create better 3D design in minutes instead of days. Uh, why we're doing that? Uh, integrating AI into architecture and design can be very challenging. There's a big learning curve with using these advanced tools, including sorting through all the research, coding, hardware, software, all this can be very overwhelming. And that's where 3D Guru comes in. 
we are building it to make AI more accessible. Our goal is to create a simple platform that makes it easy to use AI technology so professionals can focus on their creative ideas without getting overwhelmed by technical details. Um, integrating, sorry, designing 3D models and generating renders are a very uh, frustrating task because it's time consuming, tedious process, involves creating and refining multiple 3D tiny elements uh, of the design and we render it uh, many times to see the effects of the changes, even in the very early stages. And to complicate it a little bit, it stays right in the middle of a long come and go process. There's briefing, survey, you know, like inspiration, research, layout, material exploration, modeling, rendering, cost estimation, and finally documentation. And it's a huge challenge to try to optimize it and simplify this workflow. And that's our mission. Uh, to deliver a tool committed to create the best and faster user experience. Uh, we are designing a clean, very clean UI to help professionals simplify their daily work, focusing on what makes them unique, their creative capabilities. And now Mayuri will show you a live demo on how 3 Guru can hopefully uh, change the way designers do their work. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. So let me just give a quick demo. You could see my screen, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So just log into our website. So we started imagining like how a chat GPT like UI for a 3D design looks like. And we were building this product with that simplicity in mind. So our initial experiment started, what if we could just use natural language for creating like primitive shapes? So you can just type shapes you can add color and whatever parameters. And it's language agnostic. So you could say meter, X, Y, Z, whatever you could easily create those shapes. And then we thought, okay, can we templatize uh, more compositional uh, geometries with it? So to take a step further, we say, let's make a living room of same, like whatever dimensions you want, and you, you get the layout. And then we thought, okay, people want to add more 3D models into this composition. So we added a feature of drag and drop your 3D models here, but also you could just leverage all the text to 3D workflows on the fly. You could say table and we spin up a table or you can also create objects on our library. So after that, we thought, what if uh, we could also have like some templates to begin with, which you can generate parametrically and user want to, uh, let's say, modify a bit. So we added functionality of applying textures. You can modify the scale, but let's say you don't uh, like from this collection, you also have the provision where you can generate textures on the fly. You just type the name of the textures you want and we do it and you can, do same modification. And so this gives a pretty like basic uh, scene composition, but what if you want to go back and forth with this design exploration space because like design essentially is like non-linear. So we, we got this covered also. So uh, let me just take a good view. And here you get a, screen cap and then you can say, oh, let's make a uh, interior living room. American style, I'm just typing in the words. So we add that photo realistic effect to your scene composition. And 
Okay. We'll just wait for a few more seconds. And here you go. So you have this fidelity of right in your browser. And we know like not every time you start with 3D model, you can also upload an image here or you can scribble, sketch. It, it can be different ways of starting point. And uh, you could also build on top of your output generation. So you can just select this here. And let's say this. And you want to say, it's just for giving another example. So one thing we realize, okay, you, you're giving some semantic control to AI, but also you have some initial starting point. And another feature we, we thought would be useful is what if instead of AI giving a sofa, we can upload our own custom images and mask it and replace it in the scene. Right, so just to give that, so now uh, I think I will just show one example with uploading an image. Oops. So I'm just starting with a random image and then you can select any object you want to replace in the scene. So I'm just going to select one so far and you can start masking stuff yeah. yeah that's it so it will take whatever new object you want to replace it you can even add entourage so it uh you can tweak other parameters to work it but now you saw okay we did like one to one kind of mapping but what if i want to also manipulate the perspective where it's placed so let's try with a perspective cropping and let's do generate. Okay, so it tried, maybe I need a bigger mask, but you could see like the same composition. It did a pretty good job on that perspective addition. And uh, we have like various other modes of Full edit, partial edit, where you can even use like prompt without masking and say convert the sofa into XYZ or other objects. So yeah, uh, we have a lot more features, which is we are developing on the way and you can sign up. We are onboarding beta users and wanna really envision how a AI native 3D modeling approach looks like. Thank you. My, my, sorry that was uh, that was amazing um we we've now got some time for questions um i'm not quite sure how much time we do have but uh, not too long but maybe we can um um uh, invite questions from from youtube you also got billy billy um today so please send in your questions maya maybe i, I just ask you a really kind of basic question i'm i'm how do you go about this? I mean, you want to you want to launch an app. What, what is the so what, just like give us the steps? You you've got an idea. How do you go about it? Yeah. So uh, Barbara and I participate in a lot of hackathons, and I I stay in Silicon Valley and I see what are the upcoming trends, and that helped. Like we have the knowledge and we have the power instead of other outsiders disrupting our industry, what if we brainstorm together and build a product by ourselves? And also I must say, uh, like four, almost four years ago, I was first introduced to AI with digital futures. So if I can learn and develop this kind of things, people watching are also capable, it just requires efforts and dedication. So uh, 
we are like i think we are in a stage where what like speed matters a lot so what experiments and integration we do right now is going to shape really the way we'll work in future but i mean do you have to get some kind of um injection of financial support from from i don't know but i mean how does it how does it work from a financial perspective yeah that's a good question so currently we are bootstrap so that's one of the reason we are onboarding users in batch wise because like we are running all the server cost and stuff from our pocket but at some point we want to figure out the right business model and uh, also find a good balance of providing access as well as make it sustainable and, and when do you when do you envisage the, the the final version being being launched as soon as possible uh, i can't specify the date and like barbara because uh, we are still improving but uh, if you really want like an access for research purposes we can prioritize and give you very very soon so no but we're talking days weeks In general now. public yeah, yeah like um honestly the prototype is ready uh people who we are sharing access can use it right now but uh we are hopefully like don't take this on like a paper but like 6 to 6 weeks to 8 weeks are is our plan as of now to go public wow that's um that's <laughs> and do you have any any precedent is there anyone else that you've been looking to who's been doing this or the model role model from architecture or, or are you the first architect you come across yeah so there are few people building like ai 3d for gaming but nothing and of this kind of experience and few of the ui we added is like unforeseen like the simplicity there is also advanced control mode for nerds to experiment with high hyperparameters but we chose that part and barbara you can add something if i'm missing no that's uh that's i guess that the gaming industry really inspired us because they they have to be fast right and we act that sometimes we are very nerdy and we love the details and we get lost inside our processes but we got our inspiration by uh thinking how we really could improve our productivity that's our really our main focus being fast and being accessible and even fast when we say like this week there's a new launch of ai this new new thing that ai can do we are really committed to add this to our app like in a week that's our main goal like every time being the go to place for architects when it comes to ai technology and uh, so I, i keep asking these questions but but what's the overall aim i mean do you want to be bought out by autodesk or what what is it? are you going to Uh, is you going to build upon this and can, and what's the next step as it were oh like there are so many uh, new things like we we just got access to gpt4 we want to connect with what if you have your own library of assets and you can just type and directly spin up on the fly so more uh, like custom access uh, we are still like uh, i must say we are still like working uh, with the users to find like what are their needs which we should accommodate and prioritize that but long term goal is to make really good product which architects can use it and make design play and fun so uh, we are figuring out whether construction documentation like instant slide generation for mood board like what are those features we should prioritize which like really takes the client's deliverables in mind and like address the vertical aspect like start to end and so just one final question what you, you you've been spying on others in, in silicon valley or something what what have you been doing you said you've been finding out what the gaming guys are doing have you been i mean working in a bigger company and finding those things out or or how does it work yeah so like right now there is a big wave of generative ai in silicon valley so literally i attend event like two or three events a day and today itself i'm going to another hackathon it's called uh agi house uh, they are calling themselves and there are a lot of people coming and it really uh 
I try to find correlation, correlations. Okay, what are upcoming trends in natural language or other fields, and using that inside and bringing that in architecture. So people have been supportive. I think we need more designers here. They can impact uh, a lot. I don't know if we've got so many comments coming from. I would. I'd be intrigued to know what uh, um, what George and. Um, and uh, 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 Daniel, think of it as people have been working on 3D. I mean, theirs was so much more complicated, but I would be interested to know what uh, the feedback from, um, and it was certainly, thank you to both of you for your tutorials today. They really were advanced, I must say, but but very thorough. But uh, I'd love to hear what your feedback is on, on Maya's uh, work. Yeah, thanks a lot, Neil. Neil. I am uh, definitely really excited, and it's kind of, it's been building up like within the architecture industry it's like when is this product going to happen and it's really great to see you guys have taken on board and are very mindful of that speed idea because speed is speed is key or else your your value proposition is out the door you know you'll be substituted in a heartbeat and it's really it's scary but also exciting to to be in this space and to be uh, um, very ac oriented because you know generalizing these models is one side one thing and making a ui with these act like with the intention of having feedback with the intention of design parameters is a whole different ball game so i really i'm really fascinated and i love the idea of going from text to construction documentation as a prop as a provocation i think is is really good to have uh within these uh these spaces Daniel? Uh, yeah, so like I think this space is like really interesting because we're we're seeing like a new type of UI develop, right? Like now it's like the new UI is like a text box, and and that's pretty much it. Like I'm curious to see like how far you guys take this because um, I, I'm curious to see like if this eventually becomes like a new way to do it. Like if you're just gonna type and there's no longer like a needed 3D model necessarily. Um, and, and that's really interesting. Also, like, yeah, like the speed is it's case on point, right? Like you just see a thousand apps like development now, right? Um, and one of the important parts is like, how do you tailor that to specific data? Like how do you specialize and stuff like that? And how do you keep learning? How do you keep iterating and learning from what the, the users are doing um, to make it like uh, more useful essentially? Um, but yeah, I find it fascinating. I, I also think like the tools that are currently being developed by AI folks, um, they're kind of there now, uh, like for the things that you plan on doing, like those tools are available. It's just being able to create that UI that is uh, easy to navigate and how to do it at scale, right? Cause like one of these, the, the things that you're doing is like, how do you do it at scale? How do you actually do design at scale? Is it possible with just like a text bar and maybe like a few uh, gizmos or uh, 3D space? Um, and how do you make it so it's like the next stage of BIM? Like that's that's what I find fascinating. So I definitely encourage you guys to keep going and see where this takes you. Thank Maybe, you for your kind comments. Just, I mean, I just, I, the thing, I didn't know anything about this field, right? But I'm just thinking in terms of publishing. I know a bit of a bit about publishing and much of it is, is, is the kind of support you get and the distribution and all that, you know, in, in terms of a business model. It's all very well for some geeks to go and produce something that's really useful and, and letting their friends play around with it. But how do you actually really market it? Do you have, do you have some marketing advisors for this or how does that work? Yeah, so like we just launched this week. So we got like, more than 100 plus signups already and we are onboarding them and hopefully people like our audience is also like uh pretty much what digital future viewers are quite aligned with that vision so hopefully we onboard a lot of the viewers also on the uh, on the app so the uh the one thing i would mention is like if we were to give access right now like it can scale to thousands or million people easily because we designed the back end in such a way it can scale to any amount. It just <laughs> the cost part is currently uh, one factor. And also we don't want to give it very soon because uh, we want to get all the features required to do one particular phase of the design process very well. So, yeah. 
Okay. Okay. But marketing, uh, Barbara, would do you have anything to add? No, oh, that's it. Uh, we are actually not going through that right now. We are slow down a little bit in thinking pretty carefully about the UI, testing with the users, and it's a challenge. Really, it's a completely different way of designing UI for these kind of things. Like architects are used with this many buttons, this uh, uh, many screens on on their faces, and okay, that's maybe not what the way we want to go. Like we want to approach a cleaner workflow, and if we let's say try to rec recreate one of these complex designing 3D modeling tools on the web, maybe that's not what we the way we we would like to go because we are really focusing on giving the possibility to do the work of a week in an hour. That's our main goal. So it's a challenge to make it clean, but also functional. So we are perfecting it in these right. days. Yeah. But it's a fast yeah. work though. It's gonna be there soon. I yeah, so we have a lot of speed in like developing features, but we are growing organic in terms of user onboarding. I, I don't know, Leon's also here, um, and I'm not quite sure whether Leon wants to reveal his face or his avatar or whatever, but I just want to maybe ask Leon a question also, which has been say, sure. you know, breaking into a new field, you know, like the, the metaverse avatar design, um, is that something that uh, is kind of you're giving yourself away now? <laughs> um, is that something that, that I mean, how do, you, how do you go about that? finding clientele and so on. Is it, do you build upon your architectural background or, or how does it actually work? Yeah, actually we, we were founded originally as an architecture firm uh, like three years ago or so. Uh, but then uh, like around like 2021, we started doing like a first uh, metaverse projects because uh, like when I worked at Zahadid Architects, I was part of virtual reality research group. So for me, this kind of transition from virtual reality uh, architecture uh, to metaverse was quite smooth. Uh, and uh, in terms of like clientele, uh, I think there is there is a, a lot of interest from from uh, companies, like especially uh, industries like fashion. Uh, like uh, art industry, like artists, art collectors, especially in NFT industry. Uh, uh, they are really interested in uh, entering the metaverse. Also, uh, uh, automotive uh, industry is also getting into metaverse slowly. So I would say uh, the uh, also beauty and uh, beauty uh, kind of uh, industry as well. Uh, yeah, so these kind of industries are the most uh, kind of proactive in, in terms of metaverse. And uh, because uh, AI is uh, exploding now, we also uh, coupling uh, AI technology with metaverse technology, and it helps us a lot to speed up the, the development time, the conceptualizing time. Uh, and uh, we also uh, try to explain to clients that we, we create metaverse, but we also use AI tools to uh, make it efficient and more kind of uh, productive to, to, to create experiences. Uh, yeah, we create experiences, but we also create uh, even assets for metaverse, like products, like NFT products. And by NFT products, I mean like uh, three-dimensional assets, like three-dimensional content for metaverse. And so you're based in Shanghai now, right? Um, do you see a difference in terms of the market, in terms of the West and, and China, or, or is it very similar? Or, or is I mean, China, I mean, China has been, I think, you know, obviously, been completely fascinated by AI for for several years now. Maybe going back to AlphaGo, who knows what? But uh, um, but they haven't had the open AI thing there, so it's a different sort of world. And how does it? How do you compare China to the West right now in terms of all those things? uh in terms of ai or metaverse both both oh yeah okay so basically i, I know that uh, uh chinese people um, have a uh, difficulty to access those tools because most of them are, are are created by western companies in western countries 
and they usually require uh, Western accounts like mobile phone, uh, you know, and 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 so on. So, but uh, but still, like uh, I I've seen somewhere like statistics of uh, usage of GPT uh, per country, and China was at the first place. I was really surprised, actually. I mean, probably it's because also a number of people, you know, per country is uh, one of the reasons. But still, uh, uh, people uh, overcome this problem of uh, being isolated in terms of internet and access to those Western tools. And still, Chinese people use a lot of GPT, GPT recently. Uh, I, I've heard a lot of people not related to design industry or architecture industry at all, like lawyers, like um, uh, some other some other industries. They really uh, HR and and so on. They get into <laughs> GPT quite uh, fast. Uh, and in terms of metaverse, I think still um, China is a little bit behind in terms of metaverse and. Uh, clients are uh, a little more uh, careful about entering the, this industry uh, because they still don't know what it is and how to, from which side to approach it. Uh, I think from Western side, especially like in America, a lot of uh, metaverse platforms are born uh, on American side uh, currently. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, China is still a little bit behind in that sense, but uh, mm, there is an interest and there are some events happening in Metaverse I I and Web3 in general, uh, but it's a little bit slow here. Just can I, can I ask you just one thing? I mean, as you were talking, I was, uh, I, I was, because I think some of those, those, those avatars are getting pretty realistic and it, it, it it reminded me of the of, of Blade Runner and the and the um, uh, the, the uh, what were they called now? The um, it's actually uh, one of my favorite movies of all times. <laughs> yeah, but okay, so so the replicants, right? But and they are literally they they're designed to resist the um, the the harsh conditions of the outworld uh, the outworld colonies, right? In space, I mean, but an avatar is just an image. Are you are you talking about making it into a robot or something? What do you what do you mean by that exactly? Uh, by what? Well, you you seem to suggest you know this you know your avatar is going into into outer space or something under harsh conditions, but you don't need you don't have to worry about that. Are you talking about actual robots or something? Or or I was yeah I'm not quite sure I was a bit a bit lost there. Uh, I mean, like uh, for for me, uh, avatars. Uh, there are so many directions of avatars can 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 take place like. Uh, realistic uh, avatars that kind of represent humans, uh, then uh, avatars like uh, uh, robots, then avatars like uh, game avatars, or uh, also uh, on on metaverse metaverse avatars. So uh, to be honest, I don't have like a very specific uh, attitude like what ki what kind of avatars to stick to, but uh, currently we are more interested in uh, metaverse avatars. Uh, so that uh, like uh, um, people uh, even like currently we we uh, launched like two weeks ago uh, you know met platform Metamundo uh, Metamundo is like a, a 3D uh, platform for metaverse that you can buy assets for metaverse so we recently launched our first collection of uh, 3D avatars that you can buy and you can upload to most of the metaverse platforms and use it as your digital identity. But those uh, avatars, they are uh, don't look like uh, realistic humans. They look like uh, more like uh, uh, artistic kind of creatures. Neil, what? I want to ask a question. Can I say sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now it's more a question to. Uh, George and Mayur and, and Barbara and, and Danielle about uh, agency and especially about George is talking a lot about agency. I think the, the different thing that uh, Mayur's and Barbara's uh, uh, project that they show us that we at the beginning are always thinking of how can I make this 2D images into 3D and use it in architecture and now they come with some uh, a reverse uh, uh, departing from uh, a 3D that we construct, and then you can put it into into the image generation. But you can also input uh, 3Ds into the the, the, the 2Ds models. So um, 
I think that that's the what we're being trying to do is like how can we uh, have some control over these things of, over the process and not let the AI do all everything, but how can we uh, work with it? And uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe George can talk about the agency in in the process. Yeah, thanks, Angeli, because I think it's um, it's definitely a key topic, and I'm sure Mayur and Barbara are very much thinking about this. How how can we promote agency within these feedback loops between uh, behind this UI system? So uh, as we move towards 3D um, control, and control is a really interesting topic. Um, yeah, I think I think it's it's. Um, it's really important to maintain agency through the various stages of design. So I mentioned in the comments that data set curation will definitely be the next step. So how do architects make their disciplinary specific or non-disciplinary specific data sets? How do we empower the small offices as well as the large offices uh, in introducing cultural, societal, or other artifacts within their data sets? Um, the other step is within the process, how do we chain different models together? How do we use the diffusion, image diffusion models, and also bring these 3D data set, 3D artifacts or architectural forms? And then there's the whole process of intuition that's often like overlooked as like, um, we're always trying to find like validation or metrics through these AI systems, but the most important validation is our own intuition, our own curation process. So it's really important to like bring all of these different steps and there's several more within the UI or within a 2D a 2D input or 3D input. And it's um there's definitely a lot to unpack and a lot of control we can assert when generating 3D different 3D forms. Uh, Mayor, Barbara can oh sorry. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I just want us to hear all of them. I don't know. Uh, Mayor and Barbara yeah. and also Daniel only. Yeah, I can go first. Like, I think uh, what I think is, uh, let's say when we do used to do generative design and parametric design, we form the rules of the total design space exploration. When we start like just text to image workflow, we tap into the latent space of AI's design space exploration. And with the control with like either giving an input image, we just navigate uh, some part of that whole AI's design space ex exploration. But I think uh, even AI needs a back and forth feedback loop where let's say you give an input image and uh, out of 10 images AI generated, you like two, you need that feedback back to the AI so that it, it narrows down its own design space exploration to help you reach the end goal. And that control and the agents we are creating, like how can we have a design general purpose design agent which can understand the intent and can help you reach your goal faster. So you, have, you codify your intelligence with the control. AI has codified its own compositional intelligence and we mix together. Barbara, I can start that uh, we've, we've been thinking a lot and studying a lot about these agents based on embedded vectors. So using your own data to create these vectors and then using proximity to understand what is the relationship between all this uh, image data to get back to, to, to the user with a better result and this will for sure be one of the next features we are going to implement as soon as we can uh, run through the GPT-4 multimodal thing. So, and also getting back to the 3D, George, we are also studying this, um, this possibility of wild, why we have this, uh, this um, big uh, initial idea that a basic 3D model might be more than enough to create the final documents that uh, regular day basis architect need. Um, we understand that we can use computer vision for sure to regenerate the shapes that the 2D uh, created. So it's going to be a 
non-linear process come and go and you are going to be able to refine it based on your database either by Pinterest or 3D models or any other type of databases even if you want just to have your own gallery there in our app and that's going to be your database. Daniel? Um, I think uh, like what's interesting about all this is like what GPT for like these types of model architectures are making evident is that they can test the type of data. It's kind of like a new computer. Um, so pretty much from text to image to uh, some of the interesting things that I find now is that they can do kind of more um, real world data in a sense for robots. Uh, so like actions and stuff like that. And, and that can all be coupled with tech. So like you can create like an embodied AI agent that can be perceptive in all sorts of ways and perform actions as well. So that's, I think that's fascinating and that would probably have a bigger impact down the line. Um, the one thing about agency and sometimes what I think about is that um, what exactly are we trying to automate by using uh, AI? It, are we trying to automate kind of like the boring parts or and leave like the fun, the, like the parts that we find, uh, we find fun and creative to like designers or whoever's using these tools? And, or is it, are we trying to automate like uh, areas or like knowledge gaps? So for example, in the case, like if you wanna, like recent examples that have popped up from GPT before, it's like you can just type in like create an app that does this and it'll create an app and you don't have to worry about coding. So like you no longer need to know how to code, which is kind of fascinating, right? So what are we trying to automate exactly? Is it like knowledge or is it uh, creative parts? And like, how do you define creativity? Like it's creativity, the ability to you know, grab this first concepts and put them together. Um, so I think in that case, it's kind of like making us reflect on like what it means to be a creative human and what exactly do we want to automate? And I think that's, if I take it from like a critical perspective, that's probably where I would be thinking. Thank you. Uh, one thing that I uh, I think it's important also is the question of, uh, I'm talking about database, database is like the, uh, bias and also copyrights. And uh, I was reading uh, the latest article of Mario Carpo. He's very critical about uh, using AI to generate. But then we, we, if you think that, uh, how do, do we do, did it before using AI? You look at uh, uh, books or uh, uh, any sites of architecture and you have all those images on your mind and then you use them to, to create and to design. So I think what AI is doing is just help us enhance our creativity by uh, offering us mixtures or things that we will probably be doing that on our minds somehow. Uh, so, but anyway, it's it's an issue that's very important about this uh, copyright thing that, uh, and, and I think Gustavo is also asking something like this on the on the, on the chat, like how, how do we deal, we deal with the copyright in the, or the, the database? Do, do we have to create our own artificial database? So do we have to use it? Or uh, like uh, uh, Daniel Bologian is creating the database for the Volks, Volks uh, uh office. So, what is the what is the solution for us? I mean, do we have to worry about it? Or we have and debated and, and and today there's no legal. Uh, uh, it's so new that they don't have regulations about it yet. So, so, so I was just just to add, like in regards to like copyright and things like that, there is I saw something in Congress that is passing around that. They are looking at ways where, like, you have to now say that it's created by AI um, because of liability issues, right? So if you train on a specific data set um, and they find some copyrighted images, like, how do you determine, like, who's legally responsible for that? And I think when we get into, like, more critical cases of using AI for, like, let's say medicine and things like that, um, if you let AI make all the choices, like, who is responsible? Or is the doctor responsible? Or is the AI responsible? And pretty much it comes down to, like, who gets to sue who? Um, so I think <laughs> that, <the> AI. <laughs> yeah, but, but how do you sue an AI? Like, and, and then somebody yeah. can say like, yeah, but we're, we just trained and it went, but who gets to make the last decision? So I think that's another important aspect of it. But it's, sorry, isn't it, it's all based on copyrighted material being scraped from the internet so far. And, and that's not happening with Myers and uh, Barbara's thing at all. You're not, you're not scraping anything from anyone else, right? Are you? No, 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 like we are not scraping. We are developing a lot of logic on top of a uh, few uh, models which are there. And some of it 
are like uh, have been scraped from the internet so it it's like our cop, uh, our licensing follows the same licensing which this models are following like same open ai has a policy and stuff like that yeah but when you write something to transform the 3d right uh, it's going to catch up something uh, are you connected to the uh, and some model that you're going to catch that image or that mix of images and put it on the on the 3d like mm, where does it get uh, the problem our prompts where does it get the images to put it in there i mean it's going to do something work with uh, it, it depends that. so we have like different agents doing different design tasks so it depends on the design task we are top talking so uh, for example for a lot of creation you could also automate with natural language and it doesn't require even you can create 3d without any image or like just from other models so it's not necessarily you can tap it to that copyright space if you want to do ai in 3d exploration which was one good discovery we found in our exploration. And uh, one thing uh, I wanted to share, like back in the days, like three or four years ago, like in order to generate good architectural specific creation, we all had to train a GAN model on the particular style. So we had to require like a good database. We are at a time where uh, these models are very generalizable and it can do meta learning so if you give like few example example one two three do this task uh, it can do it so uh, depending on your intent we don't even need such large databases for few tasks so great thanks new do you want to um, I think I think we should do, we should uh, hold on a sec. Let me just uh, get my. Um, we should wrap it up. We're over two and a half hours. It was actually a pretty intense session too. That uh, the, the, the 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 we're kicking it off for those um, two to three D thing was was pretty astonishing. Let me just go in and just quickly um, share my share my screen again um, and um, sort of say a couple of things. One. Um, uh, um, so uh, just for everyone again, here are the, um, the the Instagram links for our contributors today. Thank you so much, everyone. That was a really brilliant session. Um, and then next time, next week, we have one on Pecha Kucha, which is going to be on the 1st of April, just to say that uh, tonight, I think, in, in uh, Europe, the clocks go back. So we'll be back to uh, 4 p.m. CET starting time next week. And then the final session is going to be a roundtable discussion. It's going to be pretty spectacular uh, with Patrick Schumacher and a bunch of other super interesting sort of people. Finally, just to say tomorrow we have on, on, on Sunday, to, uh, tomorrow at the same time, uh, we have a session in our architecture philosophy series. Um, Andre Radman and Stavros Guzolas from uh, Theo Delft talking about Henri Bergson. Um, and uh, that, that's going on for a few more sessions as well. We go on to a uh, uh, session after that. We go look at Donna Haraway, more computation in some senses, talking about cyborgs and things. So uh, anyway, I just want to sort of thank everyone today for um, a really high level session. When we when we planned this thing out to go from 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 beginners to to advanced, today was was pretty damn advanced. So so thank you so much for sharing your your knowledge and your passion and. Uh, um, and uh, this is going to be incredibly useful, I'm sure. Um, and thank you so much also to the team, to Angelica especially, but all the background team for having put this together. It doesn't go, it doesn't, uh, if it works seamlessly, it's because a lot of work's gone into it. And I finally, I'd like to ask, uh, thank Leon, um, who uh, gave away his true identity. I was hoping that people would still be guessing which was the real avatar, which was the real Leon, but never mind. Um, that was pretty impressive too. So I hope to catch up with you in Shanghai at some point, Leon. It'd be uh, great to see you there. Um, and, sure. and thank you so much. Um, uh, so see you all um, next week um, for our Pecha Kucha, which is going to be pretty spectacular. So um, thank you and uh, goodbye. Thank you thank for you. our presence. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.